as a result of that, they had a whole bunch of stuff uh, that they were uh, that they that they put into the car, and, it, and almost all of it ended up in the instrument panel or in that area in front of the car, sometimes in the console, in between the seats. And my job, among other things, was to design uh, the harness. Actually, I came in after the harness had been designed that runs across the instrument panel and you know, has connections to all of the different uh, functions that, are, that they put into that car. And uh, they were having some difficulty uh, with, the, uh, with the harness because as it goes across, you know, it's this big thing, it's a, you know, there was so much stuff. The, the bundle itself was like an inch and a half, two inches in diameter. I mean, and the, the harness, the harness weighed about 10 or 15 pounds. It was unbelievable how much copper there was in this thing. And it was stiff, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't uh, uh, manipulate it at all except for the individual wires that come out to the connectors and things like that. But the main bus that went across the, uh, the instrument panel was uh, you know, almost a structural element in itself. Uh, and the problem was that on the left side, there's a steering column that goes right through that same area. And so the harness is coming along, and then it's got to make a hump to get over the steering column and catch all the things that are over on the left side of the instrument panel. And the assembly techs in the plants were having a really difficult time uh, making it, the harness fit because it was so bulky and stiff and all of that. They had a really hard time. And um, so that was basically one of the issues that I inherited when I, um, when I came in. Uh, and so, so what we have, uh, what we had then at the time uh, was uh, at the engineering center, which is in Detroit, uh, we had these design bucks, and they were uh, they would allow you to uh, design your part and see if, you, if it would fit into the car, because they would uh, they would take actually the front end of a car or something like that and just cut it up, and then they would they would they would uh, put it on a stand and mount seats and instrument panels and whatever else to it, steering, steering columns and, and all of that. And then you could actually do some design work on um, how the harness should be going, where the fastening points would be and all of that kind of stuff. So we're all there and we know what the problem is and we're working on this um, harness design. And we get it you know, so that it looks like it's pretty good. We're pretty happy with it. And what we did was on that X section over the steering column, we actually put a metal bracket around the harness there. So we forced the wires to fit in this arc that goes over the steering column uh, with some fastening points. Uh, and uh, you know, the, the, the buck would tell us where the fastening points had to be and all of that kind of stuff and how much of an arc we needed, and, you know. All the things you need to know to design the harness. So, okay, we got a harness. Uh, so now what do we do? Well, we're going to build up three what they you know three prototype harnesses. We have a prototype shop, and they would they could actually build from a drawing by hand a harness, and they built up three of them for us. And uh, since uh, I'm in Detroit and uh, there's a plant in Cincinnati, I just took three harnesses and stuck them in the back seat of a Camaro and drove down to Cincinnati from Detroit to the Norwood plant. You know? And I, so I go marching into the uh, plant with my three harnesses, and of course people know, know that I'm coming and all of that. And so they, you know, they've set aside, well, they added, you know, what they do is they take me over, and I wasn't aware of this, but they had an, a, se a separate, you know, they have a line where they're actually building the cars, you know, the body goes down, and they, they they put seats in, and they you know attach all the various stuff you know to the to the body and to the chassis as it goes along. It's, it's an assembly plant. You know, parts come in, and uh, then they just start building the car basically as it goes down the line. Well, they have a separate line for the instrument panel because it's so complex, and and so and at some point the two meet, you know, and you take the instrument panel off. It's all basically sub-assembled and they shove it 
shove it into the car and, and, and fasten it like that. So we're in this little uh, spur line uh, off the uh, main assembly line, and uh, here comes an instrument panel. You know, they come through at one a minute. And, uh, you know, so we hand the harness uh, that I brought down one of the three to the assembly tech. And uh, so he's in there and he's struggling with it and he gets it in there. And uh, uh, all of a sudden the alignment holes don't fit, you know. And, and the thing is so rigidly designed that if there's only one way that it can make it across the top of the steering column, and they didn't line up. And uh, the only way to get it to line up was to drop the harness so it would actually interfere with the steering column and the steering column, was, you know, it was just too far, too far down. And uh, so he's struggling with it and, uh, you know, but the one minute is up and the next IP is coming. And so they, you know, take that one out and use one of the other harnesses, which they can use a crowbar and stuff like that, and they can get the harness in and they do that. And my first attempt it fails. And so the second one comes along, uh, and so we try it again, and the same result with the next uh, instrument panel. And so the foreman who's sitting there watching this, he grabs one, and he really, you know, put it in there, he's really trying to make that thing fit, and he was just putting his shoulder into it, you know, much more than any assembly tech could do for eight hours a day, you know, but he was really working to get the thing in there, couldn't get it to fit. So, you know, at, by this, at, at this point, you know, I am just uh, totally uh, shattered, you know, because I, the embarrassment of walking in there with the three harnesses that are supposed to solve this major problem that they're having and having them not fit in the least, well, they did sort of fit, but not nearly well enough, uh, that was a real humbling experience, and that was definitely the worst day of my career. No, no day even comes close to that one, where I just totally failed at what I intended to do. And so, uh, I, you know, with my tail between my legs, I am a whipped puppy at this point, and I am taking the three harnesses back into the car, and I'm driving back up to Detroit, trying to figure out what the hell went wrong. What, what is going on here, you know? And we, and we, um, I wonder if I'm missing anything here. Let's see. I think I've gotten all the terrible details in. Um, yeah. Okay, so trying to figure out what went wrong. Uh, we get back up there and we go into the, uh, the, the buck room where, where the buck is that we did our design on. We put the harness in and it fit perfectly, you know. And uh, so at that point we started looking around and we found that the buck at the engineering center had not been kept up to date and some changes had been made that were not put into the design buck. And so we designed our harness perfectly for something that didn't exist anymore. And that was why it didn't work down in the assembly plant. Uh, and uh, so when you find that kind of thing out, then you say, well, OK, where's the lesson in all of this? You know, what can you learn? And, and what I took away from that was a design buck is nothing more than a simulation. Uh, and you never, ever trust completely any simulation. Any simulation that you can come up with will not reflect what's really going on at some level. You know, at some, at, at a higher level it may be fine, but as you get down into some of the really detailed stuff, simulations will not represent what's actually happening in the real world. Um, you know, linearized differential equations 
are that. You know, they're taking a nonlinear world and linearizing it. And that linearization only works for certain a certain operating envelope. Get outside that envelope, simulation isn't any good anymore. Uh, so what what I counsel everybody and the people that take me uh, take 184D with me uh, will testify to this. I tell them, you know, I you know I show them some simulations and I say, now this is a simulation. You do not trust it. The first thing you do is you validate the simulation. You make sure that its outputs are can be duplicated on an actual uh, hard piece of hardware. And then at that point, you, you, can, you trust it for the places where you validated it. Uh, but you can't test for every possible situation. And so you can't trust your simulation for every possible situation. And uh, you have to design, when you're doing designs, and you will be doing simulations when you do designs. That's the way the world works these days. Um, simulation is a very, very large part of any design process in just about any industry that you go into. Um, uh, the cost of building prototypes and testing them exhaustively is just out, you know, it's totally out there anymore. You just can't afford to do that anymore. Uh, you know, we, uh, at, at, the, at the engineering center, we would always wonder about Boeing. You know, the first plane of a new model that they build for testing, they would sell it. They, that, that was a saleable vehicle. You know, but that was not how we worked at all. We would build dozens of non-saleable prototype vehicles to test various parts of the car and all that. And then after that, you know, the cars, once we got into production, you know, we keep them around, uh, but you know, they would not reflect all of the most recent changes and, and things like that, and so their worth would drop off very quickly as we would progress, and they would just get scrapped after a while. Very large waste of time and energy, uh, and, and people have recognized that, and computers have gotten a lot more powerful, and so a lot of that prototyping that was used to happen we used to do all the time. We started emulating the um, emulating the aircraft, the Boeing in particular, and doing a lot of simulations up front. And we, we never get to the point where the first prototype that we built we we would sell. But uh, you know, cutting down on the number of prototypes is a very large goal in reducing the time to engineer a product and the cost of engineering a product. So. You get into design work, you're going to get into simulations. I, I, it's just about a lead pipe cinch. I don't think that there's any, there's very little chance that you will not be involved in the simulations if you get into the design work. And the lesson is, you never trust completely any simulation that you've done, that you have done or anybody else has done. In particular, the ones anybody else has done, you know. You've got to make sure that they can have been validated, and you can see what, how they validated it, and you understand what the operating envelope is of the validations, so that you can be satisfied that in the actual use of the product, it's going to stay within those operating envelopes, uh, you know, an acceptable amount of time. So that's the uh, that was the lesson that I drew. Although I gotta say this. I, didn't draw it in the first two weeks after the event. It, it took a while for that to settle in, that that was really where the problem was. It, and it wasn't that I should get upset with somebody for not keeping a design buck up to date. That was, the, that was just the proximate cause. The bigger problem was of a trust in simulations that, is unwar that was unwarranted on my part. And so I've carried that lesson with me ever since. <coughs> And uh, I hope that it helps you guys if you get yourself into a situation like that. So that was my worst day in my career and what I learned from it. And thank you very much for listening.